Well, uh, welcome. Uh, and if you have attended one of these before, um, I think you know the format. We at Cubicle like to talk about various themes around data literacy, which includes topics like data democratization, you know, higher education, macro and micro trends in data literacy, and many other things. Uh, but of course, today is special. Today is about the big words, uh, artificial intelligence. And um, of course, people are saying we are in the midst of, you know, probably a fourth industrial revolution. Um, automation and breakthroughs in AI and artificial intelligence is really causing a revolution in the workplace. And in this era of quick change and, you know, where skills have a short half-life, upskilling just cannot be an afterthought. It is something that organizations have to lead with. Um, Reskilling and upskilling has to constantly evolve uh, into requirements that uh, mean continuous professional development for employees. Mm. I was just talking to our guest earlier today, and we both agreed on this analogy of kind of shooting at a a target, but now it's almost like a moving target. You know, the target is constantly moving. You think you're planning for an AI or a literacy uh, plan, and you have to constantly shift it. That's how quick the technological advancement has been. But you know what? Um, being data ready and uh, putting data democratization at the center of AI literacy continues to stay fundamental simplifying it, making it accessible. Um, and as they correctly say, um, if your data is not ready for generative AI, your organization will never be as well. So with that, uh, I'm just gonna set stage for what to expect in today's session. Um, we have um, you know, a little bit of a discussion um, with Semi, and I would love to leave some additional time for Q&A at the end. So we're gonna fly through the first couple of bits for 10 minutes, um, perhaps, I'll pick up some questions with Semi over the next 10 minutes, but we'd love for the attendees to fire away all the questions that you have for Semi in the chat. You would be able to do so right away, uh, and we can pick them up at the end of the session. So um, feel free to pop them through the course of the session, and we'll try as best as answer as many as possible by the end. Um, and then, of course, Semi's experience and expertise would be really, really helpful to understand a little bit, little bit more on decompressing um, AI literacy, unpacking common themes, and of course, his recommendations on what organizations, what teams, and what managers can do to build an enterprise that is AI ready. Um, so with that, we're also about to share a poll just to understand our audiences a little bit better. So firstly, do share with us you know, what your role um, within your organization is, what you do, kind of what level of artificial intelligence you are involved in. Um, and then you will also see a second part of the question on the poll, which is how would you rate your organization's AI readiness? Now, just to define AI readiness, does your organization have a strategic response or a training response to artificial intelligence? If as an employee, you feel you have a, a scale of one to four, where would you where would you pin or plug your organization on that scale? So let us know in the poll that you're seeing on your screen about right now. Um, and if you struggled to answer that question, um, we would also be sharing a an internal tool uh, that you can use. Um, it's just a self-reflective set of seven questions, a quick assessment to, to see what are the things to consider when assessing your organization's AI readiness. And at the end of these second uh, seven questions, uh, we will also give you kind of key deliverables um, on where you might be at your strategy. So without further ado, let's get into talking about the most important thing uh, I guess everywhere today, everybody's talking about it. If you're in learning, if you are, you know, a consultant, if you are literally working even remotely with technology, AI is coming to the forefront of everything. And before we can fully embrace this revolution, I think we have an obligation to reskill our talent, to use these technologies effectively and really equip them to, to succeed in today's um, environment. We um, we at Cubicle read a study by IBM, and it says that ex executives almost estimate that in the next three-ish years, 40%, that's 40%, 40% of the workforce may need to reskill as a result of implementing artificial intelligence or automation. Now, this is actually a very 
profound uh, figure, 40% in the next three years. And it's largely because humans need a diverse set of skills, right? It's not just technical proficiency. It's a human understanding. It's adaptability in their thinking. And you almost have to not feel threatened by this technology. You have to learn how to work alongside it, you know, befriend it to its best capability. And while this um, 40% seems really, really daunting, um, the demands of today's workforce present a unique, um, not just threat or risk, but I would say, you know, have glass full, almost an opportunity for people to completely, um, you know, enter desired skills oriented jobs in the digital economy and completely change the way that they have envisioned their careers. So we need to think about our approach to reskill uh, and achieve this goal and ensure that the skills of our workforce actually match the pace of the technological advancement that we're seeing as well. So with that, you know, of course, just uh, representing an e-learning company and doing this uh, sort of every day for the last three and a half years, we serve about 300 plus enterprises. And while this pathway that you see on my screen might not obtusely represent every organization, you know, organizations are at different journeys um, with their upskilling. We found that there were some general themes that emerged when all of this started, right? So the rise of generative AI, I think especially text gen AI, which was open AI, right? Took everyone by surprise. So some would say even blindsidedness, right? So chat GPT, just for context, which has undergone exponential growth, um, I think from November, 2022, uh, it had acquired or amassed active users, which was 1 million unique users in, I think, just five days. And for context, it took Facebook 10 months and Netflix three and a half years to amass that exact number. So just the context of three days and three and a half years is just the rapid scale of advancement of this technology. And we, as a trading provider, obviously consulted people in their training response to this technology. And while it has definitely been disruptive, um, there were no controls in place, right? Uh, people were really intrigued. I remember texting my friends. We were all talking about it. It was all over on Slack. Companies was not prepared. It was also very easily accessible. There were no barriers to adoption. So it did initially catch a, you know, a few companies offhand. And some of these companies obviously had AI policies in place, but a lot of them did not. So then came, I guess, step two, which I like to call the duct tape stage, right? Like, let's just, can we do something that's just like quickly good enough to mitigate any risks that come with this? So let's duct tape it. Let's put good enough controls in place, ban the IP, you know, let's issue a statement. And in most cases, or in some cases, that statement was, look, let's not use this thing. We're not going to touch it. We don't know uh, whether the benefits outweigh the risks. We have not stress tested it. So as much as it came to rise quickly, there were not just equal opportunities that emerged, but equal amounts of risk. And we will talk a little bit more about this with Semi later in the session. But, you know, whitelisting IPs, making it inaccessible was what we saw kind of as the second response. And then, of course, after that, step three was a commercial and risk mitigation response, um, risk mitigation being first, of course. And then finally, after all of that, you know, the dust sort of settled, businesses said that, you know what, how can we implement AI in strategy? How can we make sure that these conversations are making its way into business discussions? And, um, you know, it followed a more mature response by enterprises uh, following that. They basically tamed the dragon by step four. And after all of this, it was safe to say that I guess a waterfall of two specific learner personas or learning cohorts emerged. And one being the, you know, the kind of consumers or, oh, here's AI, here's what I need to do with it. Here's the technology uh, and I need to sort of work with it. And the second was, you know, the the one that required almost this deep, um, this kind of deep uh, responsibility for execution, the builders, um, you know, the people that required deep technical competence within the organization to help enterprises build more further competence with this. And uh, speaking of deep competence and deep technical capability, I am more than delighted to introduce our panelist for today, none other than Semi. 
Um, SEMI has been a very good friend to Cubicle. We have been working alongside uh, PwC's Academy in the Middle East for the last many, many years. Um, I think a lot of what I personally know about artificial intelligence comes from Semi's thought leadership on LinkedIn. He is almost always up to date about everything that's happening. So um, I was delighted that he agreed to speak with me on this session. He is a LinkedIn's top voice on AI. He is a top 50 thought leader in AI and also a global artificial intelligence ambassador. So welcome, Semi. Thank you for joining us today. It's really nice to have you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Daniel. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks all the participants. Uh, I see quite a lot for their time as well. Uh, so it's safe to assume that you are very, very busy at the moment. How is life <laughs> in the world of artificial intelligence? <laughs> yeah, it is It is extremely uh, busy. Only to catch up with the advancements requires a good amount of effort, good amount of uh, my time. Living alone, the projects, all the deliveries uh, aside, it's, it's, uh, if you like, if you enjoy it, like as an AI passionate like us, of course, it's a great time to live through that from that perspective, uh, enjoying it to the maximum. Love that. Let's uh, let's ride the AI spiral together, uh, you know, as they say. But with that, I'm going to just get into it, Sami. You know, we, of course, you have shared so much information, even on your LinkedIn. I learn a lot of news that you share constantly as well. But initially, um, going back to my statement of phase one, right? Employees ended up leaking so much sensitive information on chat GPT. Like we remember Samsung uploading directly, like I guess code to this large language model along with other bits of you know Im important information. So my question to you is firstly, what are the what are the possible risks that organizations need to, uh, I guess, be aware of, you know, when when um, playing with technologies like this, and also what can organizations do to mitigate these risks? Uh, the the obvious risk is of course the leakage of information, like unconscious or unaware uh, use of these technologies. This had happened even uh, before in two thousand sixteen, I think there was a. Uh, the data leakage uh, and the, the employees of a large company, I don't want to name, put their co code in on GitHub. The code included their uh, AWS login credentials for auto login and everything. So this is this was a common uh, uh, common risk for the companies for a while. But for the Gen AI tools specifically, I would like to focus a little bit more on that. One um, big risk is the inaccurate data. Even these tools are highlighting, right? The results might not be, the output might not be accurate. So if we are not uh, conscious about that one, the result might be inaccurate and take a uh, copy that information and put it to, to one of your documents, projects were done, you, you will face that when the credibility issues um, are there. That's, uh, I think, is the biggest uh, thing, bigger than leakage when in terms of the possibilities. Uh, other one is the IP related issues. Now these companies are facing a lot of lawsuits uh, from the producers of the content of the media. Uh, and because it, it, uh, they didn't pay them anything and they're using their information. But uh, also when generating the content, it is collating that what it was trained on, the, some other people's uh, data. But in some instances, it might directly use that data as well that you are not aware of because it is not giving any citation or anything. So if you get the output and put it somewhere and someone notices and someone can prove that it was their work uh, originally, again, the, the companies might uh, uh, face these IP related issues or uh, so, so as well. Uh, so these are the, the highest uh, risks that uh, I see. Uh, companies are facing in the time of uh, Gen AI. The, of course, mitigation would be mostly about uh, AI. Uh, sorry, not AI. <laughs> Everything is about awareness, not AI. Awareness about these tools specifically. So until one year ago, 
our uh, topic focus was awareness about AI. Now, of course, it shifted to awareness about Gen AI, the uses of these uh, uh, these tools, but some specific awareness about the risks associated with uh, using these tools. Many companies are doing have been doing phishing campaigns to educate the employees not to click on those uh, phishing emails, etc. Now we need to think new ways, creative ways, how we can train employees not to leak data, not to uh, go into fall into this risk associated with these uh, technologies. Um, no, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And do you find, like, I'm, I'm sure you're deeply involved with, um, five, you know, organizations implementing acceptable use policies. Do you find, is everyone aware that they need to have one in place? Um, have you, have you found there are certain things that they must include in their Gen AI use policy? Uh, not, not everyone is aware for, for when, when looking at all my engagement with our, with our clients in the region. Not everyone is aware, not everyone has an uh, acceptable use uh, policy. We, we developed this quite early, already in the February uh, last year, and uh, because of the nature of our business uh, mainly, uh, but definitely not everyone aware. So this should include, this should start with that, uh, I think, awareness uh, thing. So it should start with don't take the output uh, of these tools directly in your uh, final work. I think it should be something. Uh, second emphasis would be to not put any company data, any company related information, unless you are using the licensed version or enterprise version. When you use the enterprise edition, at the bottom it says, your data is not used to retrain the uh, chat GPT model. So it is only, staying in your conversation with uh, chat gpt it's it's uh, something else but not many companies are uh, doing that mainly it is personal account uh, by the by the employees uh, so these uh, uh, two things should be uh, highlighted and it should be some constant uh, communication some check-ins some uh, feedback how much are you and also if they IT teams can monitor the usage at least on the company devices, how many times login, et cetera, et cetera. So they're also navigating themselves around that moving target. Absolutely. And if you are, if one of our listeners has not, you know, if you come from a smaller, medium sized business and you don't have an AUP in place, you can uh, Google Cubicles Gen AI Company Use Policy Template and download it for free. And it would give you a little bit of a guideline of what sort of AUPs to put in place as an organization. Um, let's talk a little bit, of course, you know, Sammy, I know you're a PhD. You're also, uh, you teach on the side. You're also deeply involved in the, the academy. So learning culture is obviously a lot of at the forefront of your experience. How do you, you know, again, I'm going to use that analogy of that moving target, right? We as an e-learning provider almost have to keep, you know, we look at something that, okay, we're going to do this. And then it's it's a constantly changing and a constantly mushrooming landscape. How do you firstly make sure that you're staying on top of this? Um, you know, new tools and technologies, uh, new learning objectives. And how are you even just managing the rate of progress within your learning culture as an organization? Uh, yeah, so just to share a personal uh, note, I'm not using social media except for LinkedIn. So I'm <laughs> quite active on LinkedIn, as you know, but I'm not uh, on any. Even uh, WhatsApp, I wasn't using WhatsApp uh, until four years ago before I moved into uh, Dubai. Um, so uh, I am doing, uh, instead of like... Uh, following, uh, trying to follow something on social media, I'm constantly, consciously looking for the reliable resources mm -hmm. and I'm subscribing to the newsletters. So that is uh, my way of, and uh, in average, I'm receiving around 50 newsletters every day. Uh, of course, I don't have time to read all of them, go through all of them. So I'm just uh, parking them uh, in my uh, newsletters folder, scanning through the uh, quickly 
And when something catches my eye, I'm going into uh, details. And some of them are, of course, much more uh, credible, much more reliable. I'm trying not to miss them, etc. Uh, and also when there are um, some uh, episodes of uh, the top uh, podcasts, sub uh, YouTube uh, shows, etc. I'm also just uh, watching all the interviews with the CEOs of these uh, famous companies now, Genii companies, etc. Uh, so the, this is uh, my way of um, catching up. Also, because I'm in the uh, training business as well, like mm. teaching something is like the one a uh, good level of uh, ex- uh, reaching excellence or expertise in, in one topic. And also it is driving me to, to keep up uh, with that one uh, as well. So it is my passion. Learning is my passion. Of course, it is not a burden for me. Now I'm just living and breathing it. Uh, it's, it's quite, uh, maybe it sounds so easy uh just for the audience as well uh but i i like i enjoy doing this uh a lot but only i need to put some uh, effort behind it to be able to uh, catch that moving target no love that love love the fact that you are you know you're constantly on top of things and that you're um very focused i guess on learning and excited by learning uh you know, I am too, which is why I work for Cubicle. Um, <laughs> would you, on that note, I mean, since you mentioned podcasts or newsletters, would you have any, maybe a couple of recommendations on what people can listen to or add to? I, I definitely will go and subscribe if there is anything that jumps out to you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, one of the top newsletters is The Batch by DeepLearning.ai. Uh, it is founded by Andrew Eng, like one of the fathers of AI. And uh, there is another one called Inside AI, specific to um, uh, AI. Uh, another one, uh, MIT's Technology Review is quite uh, good as well. Also, Stanford has HAI. I'm just trying to remember H. Is it something human or whole, I don't remember that abbreviation, uh, honestly, but uh, Stanford HAI, they are, every year they are launching their uh, AI index, which is quite uh, good work uh, by them. And <laughs> from the podcast, uh, Lex Friedman's uh, AI podcast is amazing. Uh, he had a more than, longer than one hour interview with uh, Sam Altman, like around five, six months ago. It's a uh, uh, must watch uh, if you are into Gen AI and ChatGPT and everything. Uh, Bernard uh, Mars uh, podcast is also quite uh, uh, good. He has some good books as well in broad like business applications of uh, uh, AI. And uh, uh, yeah, these are the top ones that uh, are popping to my mind at the moment. That's great. I mean, the shortcut of kind of watching all of those is just to follow Semi on LinkedIn and he shares the best of all of those. <laughs> so that's what, that's, what, that's what I try to do. Um, but yes, absolutely. And, you know, of course, like you mentioned, that individually being super motivated and looking into these technologies constantly, but we're also noticing that organizations and learning and development teams need to also have that sort of motivation so that learning culture can really like seep in at, at an employee level or even make it its way up at a strategic level and um, speaking of strategic level again um, PwC's 27th annual global CEO survey was recently out and of course I read it and it is very Gen AI heavy Um, you know a lot of discussions about investments in AI and a, a lot of you know leaders are talking about how Gen AI is going to deliver significant you know top bottom line benefits and all of that now with that I wanted to get your thoughts on how important it is to train leadership on the technology, you know, and by, and also when you train leadership, um, to what extent do you train leadership, right? Because they're not going to be the builders of these technologies. They will mostly still take a kind of strategic, a top level view on things. So Mm -hmm. as a learning person, what level of, or what quality of leadership training do you Mm -hmm. recommend for AI? Yeah, so I I, I would spend um, like around twenty percent of the time to on the technology itself, just to 
so they're aware of the capabilities of these tools. What ChatGPT can do, other uh, generation um, platforms, uh, tools can do, etc. They may or they might not use them because those people have the <laughs> PAs already, right? Personal assistants, and they're uh, doing the job of ChatGPT already. So that's another uh, thing. Uh, more time, I would spend on the implications of these tools on the skills on the future of the employees. And this is one of the uh, most frequent questions, concerns we receive from the clients. So they're just trying to draw a picture of the future so that they start planning for the future. They start planning or preparing their employees for that uh, future. With, uh, you know, through COVID, we, the digital transformation efforts increased and we were talking about AI already, but now, we, we are at the, the maximum of it. Even, you know, we, we have uh, several conferences here, uh, JITEX, Leap, etc. In a tech conference, it's normal that AI is uh, like one of the hot topics or one of the uh, like uh, largest uh, subjects. But now general conferences like World Economic Forum this week, AI is the hottest topic. It is World Economic Forum. It's not a World Technology Forum or something like that. So that is now the, in the agenda of uh, even government leaders. Uh, so they should have a clear picture of that implications of the on the future of the company, mainly about the uh, skills, not uh, about business model, uh, mainly about the skills of the uh, employees. Uh, that uh, there are some uh, tools, some techniques available to to predict like how much of each title, each uh, person can be automated, will be done by AI, et cetera, et cetera. There are some estimates uh, about it as well. Uh, so that is a uh, very important um, uh, knowledge to be, or uh, some kind of appreciation to be gained by the leaders and also uh, a strategy workshop attached to it. Okay, we know what it is, what are the implications. So what are we going to do with it? How are we are going to transform the skill set of the entire organization to utilize this 64% uh, uh, believe that there will be increase in the efficiency of the, how we are going to reap those benefits. Uh, roadmap, which includes, of course, an upskilling uh, or general uh, training program. Uh, and then how the shape of the workforce will look like. Are we going to keep the same number of employees, less employees, more employees, and how the titles will uh, be job uh, descriptions, roles, responsibilities. I think this is lying in the shoulders of the leaders a lot. I have been uh, mentioning it, emphasizing for years now, at least for five, six years, now, Jenna, I uh, made uh, my point, like proves my point <laughs> that it should be on the <laughs> shoulders of leaders and they should spend. And also linked to that, it is linked to HR and LLD teams as well. So they share that responsibility in that uh, uh, future proofing. No, absolutely. And I think you and I are obviously fortunate to have or be or represent organizations that are obviously very involved and very, um, I guess, on board with uh, with the sponsorship of AI, you know, decentralization of training and decision making and so on. But for certain, I guess, you know, all organizations are not at that same learning curve. In the in the absence of leadership buy in, what do you think L and D professionals can do? To really get that buy-in from their leaders, like what, what, like obviously, if, if there's somebody sleeping on this, is it's it's too late for that. But what can people really do just to signal sort of buy-in from their leaders for traditional companies? Uh, uh, I think they they need to show um, some kind of pilot uh, projects. So there is this empirical study. They work with almost 2,000 business professions from different domains, and they gave them text uh, generation tasks or writing tasks. The text generation is the fancy name. Uh, writing tasks with AI and without AI. And uh, efficiency improvement, productivity improvement was 37% with AI. 
So less time, 37%, less time to complete those tasks. So they need to show these kind of tangible proofs to get there by, okay, we need to get either the license, provide them the training, prompt engineering, and everything, et cetera, et cetera. So that, uh, uh, I think that that should be there. If you link it to, okay, you have a lot of uh, people who are doing this kind of similar tasks in HR, in marketing, in reports, like financial reports, et cetera, et cetera, then uh, I'm sure like uh, no one could resist for a 37% uh, <laughs> saving or productivity improvement. Yeah, definitely. Um, and with that, I mean, I guess the main main point that we have all been talking about through the course of the presentation is, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, that why is now the most important time to democratize AI training across the organization? I guess everybody needs to have a foundational level of knowledge. So like, why do you think in your words that's mm -hmm. important? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it is... Um more important than ever because now everybody is aware and everybody started doing something about it so far until we one year ago postponing was still an option but still now uh, more people started this uh, race or this started uh, some kind of uh, implementation so the risk of falling behind is um, is higher now or is more uh, uh, dangerous now because also at the same time the innovation also is getting faster and faster as we have been talking about that moving target uh, so that uh, that is obvious to uh, provide that um, access to everyone uh, and also it is required uh, essential in general i see this as a citizen-led innovation area so the um, IT team, so the AI would be the main responsibility of the IT team, but they have limited time and uh, capacity resources to innovate for everyone in the company. It is not just one tool that, okay, we purchased this license, this technology, this tool to be shared by everyone. No, the best AI solutions are the one trained by your own data. Mm -hmm for marketing data, for learning data, for HR data, for finance data, and IT teams cannot do that for every department. So it should be driven by the business. If you know AI, if you know the techniques, if you know what it can do from the use case sets, then you can push the IT team for a project. You can draw it and you can just work on the benefits versus costs, etc. Then um, it is possible because of the nature of AI, the citizen that innovation is the correct path, uh, I believe. And also the use of uh, Gen AI itself with uh, all these benefits, with the CEO's agenda, also the employees follow uh, that one. We see this uh, in many organizations as well, even in the uh, government level. The leaders have very high ambitions. They believe in the technology. They see that uh, those benefits, etc. But the employees are a bit, you know, following slowly, following behind that ambition and require more time to uh, catch up and achieve, fulfill those uh, ambitions, etc. So, it is also important to embrace and uh, start start using those tools. Um, absolutely, which is why I would almost replace learning and development recommendations and instead call it, uh, I guess, an organization wide change management initiative. Right? It's no, it's not just the IT team, and it's not just um, each individual. It is the responsibility of every leader, every manager. Uh, not just, uh, I guess, upskill, but in some cases, even reskill the organization, right? It's, and like you mentioned, Sami, it does not uh, come down to just the IT team. It takes a whole village. It takes the creation of the ecosystem. In fact, to cope with these disruptions, um, a number of organizations are already investing heavily in upskilling their forces. We, we read a BCG study um, and it said that there's investments even up to 1.5% of total budgets of organizations that are going into reskilling and upskilling their whole organization. And if the, you know, the OECD estimates are close to correct, 
in the coming decades, um, I guess millions and millions of workers may need to be entirely reskilled. And again, I, I see it as a fundamentally profound and complex societal challenge, which will require mm -hmm. workers to not only acquire new skills, but to use them to change occupations in many ways, you know, equal amounts opportunity in some ways. So, mm -hmm. of course, among the ones that have embraced the reskilling challenge, a um, handful of them are doing it effectively. Even their efforts have been subscale and we're seeing off limited impact. And that is obviously to grow in the future. But this leads me to my question to you is, what must companies do to make it happen to 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 this reskill revolution? What must companies do? Um, so I I would like to draw an optimistic feature about uh, this one that forty percent uh, figure. Uh, so we did, we can see this kind of a uh, disruption as well in if in that sense that. Uh, uh, but if you look at the recent disruption that we have been through the COVID. All of us adapted to it, right? Like this uh, tool Zoom wasn't so good before COVID. Even Zoom adapted. We learned how to use Zoom, do our jobs remotely, et cetera, et cetera. Not many people rejected to adapt. Like, oh, I don't want to learn how to use Zoom, how to do this, deliver training via online, engage, interact with people. We, we adapted it. So this uh, this just to build the confidence this is a like a good one and also uh, from the disruption by technology i'm seeing it from the business side from in our daily lives we have been using it for uh, almost decades now ai has been there in many many uses uh, when i ask people are you using chat gpt it's mainly about telling stories to their kids or recipes for their cooking or tips for the for their travels etc uh, but another uh, like technological perspective uh, is the use of computer like currently if you look at i don't know if imf did these kind of estimates 50 years ago uh, 50 years ago there was no business professional doing their jobs with their computers right because computers did not exist 50 years ago. Currently, can we think of any business professional, blue, white color employee, doing their jobs without a computer? Also no, it's like, and back, but during the interviews, are we asking them, do you know how to use a computer? No, right, it's, it's become a, a given skill now. Uh, so we will go through this kind of a, uh, uh, transition in terms of the um, skills that uh, the we will be using, we will utilize uh, a lot AI to do our jobs easier, better, faster uh, asset. So that's my uh, vision. The companies how um, so one thing there's an interesting trend related to another perspective: the will AI take our jobs kind of stuff. Uh, so now some companies started to uh, freeze hiring or stop hiring for the roles that are likely be, to be replaced by AI. So they are not firing anyone, but if people resign, they are not uh, hiring uh, people again to these roles, anticipating and also pushing people to solve an AI, to build an AI solution to do those uh, tasks uh, in a, that, that way. So uh, that uh, would be the implications of how the, the workforce will, will shift. For the existing employees coming to, it's been a long answer, uh, upskilling and uh, recycling. I think that uh, assessment uh, will, be, will need to be done at uh, one point. So for the common titles, departments, teams in the organization, how much we can automate each one? How much of them are open to uh, automation in the near future, uh, et cetera? I think that assessment uh, will need to be done at some point. It's very rare now. There are some tools uh, available. I've seen only one company uh, doing that uh, so far. I think that that needs to be done to uh, really uh, uh, do that because every job uh, is different. 
using uh, or requiring to use the in-depth, as you said, AI being yielding AI solutions versus just being the users, innovators with it, etc., is is quite uh, different. So that assessment will be um, uh, important. Uh, from upskilling versus uh, reskilling, I'm I'm seeing uh, like uh, I think we will do both of them for everyone constantly because new tools will be coming, so we will do the upskilling uh, anyway. Uh, but uh, also the reskilling because we will be uh, soon doing these jobs like the uh, Microsoft Office launched their own tool for this one. If you know that and if you want to go back and do, okay, I will analyze my data manually. I don't want to use it. It's quite a luxury. Uh, and uh, that, that will require reskilling for uh, pretty much everyone. So I'm seeing it will be constant, like maybe we can add a cycle around your show visual here, upskilling and reskilling, upskilling and reskilling uh, will, will go on continuously. Yeah, and I I love the I love the optimism and half class full of you know how we just taught ourselves to yeah. you know work with computers. We taught ourselves to you know go onto the remote work and work from home and all of that, and you know that's in line with how kind of online learning platforms like ourselves has have have emerged and have become key, um, you know, to constant upskilling and reskilling. So. Online learning platforms, just for context, are expected to grow nineteen percent in the next four years, and why we need to lean into that trend is because you know while ai is breaking down barriers to quality education online learning is not static you know you we we go back for example even other technologies we're updating our power bi training right we're um, making sure that training is accessible um you can even go beyond that and think about partnering with academic institutions you know public private partnerships but embedding these kind of reskilling programs in you know, just ensures a seamless transition of a more agile, a more tech savvy and future ready, uh, optimistic workforce that both me and Semi hope for. Um, and with that, I'm just obviously going to uh, be aware of our time. We have two minutes left on the webinar, but Semi, we have so many questions here for you. Um, are there any that you would like to pick out and, you know, perhaps answer in context of, of our L&D strategy as well? I see people have questions around learning approaches or um, is there any particular question that jumps out to you that you'd like to answer for our audience? Yeah, going through. I think we already answered the newsletter questions. Mm -hmm. Cohort finance or oh, financial services. Interesting. Okay. In in finance, we have been doing uh, forecasting, budget allocation, etc. Mostly manually, mostly very, I would say, like common analysis, like trans analysis, projections, etc. Uh, so I would uh, recommend them uh, do learn specific uses of machine learning in finance for forecasting, regression, etc., etc. That that will uh, change the way they they get the most out of their data uh, a lot. Um, and if. If there are people on uh, on the webinar that do not know where to start and do not even have a foundational understanding of uh, artificial intelligence, highly recommend you to go and check out our AI curriculum on Cubicle. We're launching a, an AI Academy. We've produced a few of these courses already. So you'd see a foundational intro to, you know, basic concepts of business application or even slightly intermediate concepts like predicting future values and scenarios, but of course, you know, going deeper into LLMs or building business applications. Um, it's a very easily accessible and easy to do course. Um, so look into that and Semi, again, I know we are on time, but I would love for you to maybe take two, three minutes to answer another couple of questions. I see there is one that says, um, are there any fairly forward AI opportunities to focus on for enterprise organizations who are using the Office 365 enterprise across the business? So um, big discussions on the MS tooling stack, of course. Do you have any recommendations on that? 
Uh, yeah, it's the, the co-pilot uh, has been available for a while now, and I got uh, access as well. Uh, just uh, using that, providing them to heavy users of our office, I think is the obvious uh, next step. It is just uh, using AI directly with uh, very, very less effort. Uh, thanks very much. Um... That brings us to the end of our session. Unfortunately, uh, as much as Sammy's time is precious, I would love to stay and chat for many, many more minutes, but uh, it is Q1 and I know how busy you are, Sammy. So once again, uh, from Cubicle's behalf and on behalf of all of our watchers and listeners, thank you very, very much for your time uh, and for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, and thank you everybody for listening. This webinar is also available for uh, downloading on demand if you want to go back and reflect on any of the many amazing things that Sammy said. So thanks everyone and I hope you have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much Eno again for having me and thanks to everyone uh, for their precious times for spending the time to listen. Hope it's been uh, useful and looking forward to uh, keeping in touch. Bye Sammy. Thanks a million. Thank you.